Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Cloud Chats. Today's episode, Rocky Linux, CentOS Stream, and Malicious PyPy Packages. Ooh, and I even, I said it wrong. It's PyPy. Said it wrong. I said it wrong, and I'm the Python person, okay? So <laughs> let this be a lesson that things in Python naming space kind of weird. Ah, so good morning, everyone, and welcome from the Cloud Chats crew. These are my friends, Matt, Chris, and darn it, I quit. <laughs> oh. And Kim, and Kim, <laughs> Matt, Kiss, Krim, not what this. What you need is a what? stream deck is an emergency what? flip button. I do. What I need is like a sticky note, and I'm going to start putting it. It's like point <laughs> this way, Mason. So inverse things. I never get it. However, I do play with inverse controllers whenever I game. So it's a mystery. It'll always remain a mystery. <laughs> What's up, everybody in chat? Uh, Jacob, hey there. Uh, let's see. Love Kesh, welcome back. Yay. Love Kesh is awesome. It's a regular now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's great to have uh, regulars. I love having regulars. Lucas, I appreciate that. We all appreciate <laughs> that. Some good tunes to start the show. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So our Hello World question of the day, and this will be a really fun one for us. Um, we do seem to keep pulling the ones from our team meetings, um, so that's great. Uh, is if you had the ability to travel back in time and witness one event or visit one place, what would it be? Like if you could go back in time, not, you know, don't step on a butterfly and mess everything up, um, but could go and witness a significant event or visit a significant place or even an insignificant place, who cares? Um, where would you go? You're, you're telling me start that with you're using your team meetings already, so... I'm the only one that actually has to think about this. Yes, which is which <laughs> I, would mean which mean it's only one. yeah, which would mean it's only logical that Matt goes first because we're sure. making him think on his feet. Sure. Um, ooh, first space shuttle launch. Of It'd course, be really it's cool always, to be there and actually in person watch that watch that happen. Space with you, Matt. Okay, <laughs> like, do you want to be an astronaut? <laughs> no, not at all. No, you just want to watch from a distance. <laughs> yep. Oh my goodness. There you go. Okay. There you go. There's Other, there you go. So I know they're called astronauts and sometimes they're called cosmonauts, like in Russia. What does the UK call people astronauts. who go into space? Yeah. Astronauts. The, the astronauts pretty much all over the world, apart from Russia, question mark. I'm not an authority Wikipedia if you really want to know. But okay. yeah, I think it's everywhere. <laughs> and there's like then a whole load of rules about like who actually is an astronaut. Yeah. Like Good morning astronaut. and welcome to welcome to Space Chats, <laughs> <laughs> where we don't talk about the cloud, we just talk about space. Well, you know, um, space I have bad cloud. news for Mason. My answer is I would like to see the Apollo 11 launch, uh. <laughs> which was the first the when the men went on the moon. Um, and I talk about this quite a bit at this point, but there's a really great CNN documentary about Apollo 11 um, that's has so much amazing historical footage and just so much information about what an engineering challenge, like getting people into space and then they sort of like launch themselves toward the moon. Uh, I'd like to be there for that. <laughs> also the fashion at that time was really different than it is now. So I would love a makeover <laughs> into the fashion of that time. Like a what, 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 what is that? <laughs> What is that like? That's what fifties and sixties. I think it was in the sixties. Was, this, was, this, yeah. was the space race? I mean, like, so John Glenn orbited in like early sixties. So I guess the space race would have started. So and well, Apollo eleven would have been later. That would have been like late sixties. That was JFK, 60. right? He he's the one who announced it on television. Apollo eleven was sixty nine, right? Yeah, that, that would have been JFK. I think JFK was president then. Anyway, welcome to Space Chats and History Channel. Um, <laughs> Chris, where would you go? And if it's space related, I'm gonna rage quit. Oh, that's a good point. Um, wait, oh, we'll... Chris. Okay, I'm so, just... sorry, space related. Do it. I'm I'm just looking at the question. Okay, it, it is back in time. I was hoping there was like also anywhere in time, um, because then I'd go forward to our settlements on Mars. Mm. We'll do forward in time next week if we. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, let me do space related then. Um, oh. Hmm. I mean, big asteroid hitting the Earth. I would oh. survive this thing, right? Like, or would I just go yes, there? Yes, you would. You would be. You would be. be you would survive. You would be able to witness and interact, <laughs> and then you could leave. 
you just All observe. Right, then, <laughs> yeah, okay. If that's the case, then uh, big cosmic like explosions. I like that answer. That be like, be what actually happened to the dinosaurs? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I would go back and view like the Library of Alexandria. Hmm. I that I've always been fascinated with that the idea that you know more hu more hu more knowledge than we've ever gained was lost when we when it burned is just interesting so like I would I want to know what's in those books and I would assume that we're gonna have like some sort of like if anyone who knows Doctor Who will have some sort of TARDIS translation matrix so I can read everything in there nice. so I'm not was, just looking at as well but, you know, like yes sure you you can survive any event can you read the language of the time? yes well yes we, yes we, we will bind ourselves to Doctor Who law where we can read <laughs> communicate and survive everything. We just have to take a cheeky British person with us, which is why we have Matt. Whole reason he's on the show. <laughs> in the event of a Doctor Who like situation. Yes, in, yeah. in the event of in the event of time travel, break glass for cheeky British person. We have Matt. <laughs> oh well, let's say yeah. hey to some people who have said hi in the chat. Uh, so we've got Abdullah, uh, welcome, Mavenir, hello, and then Mavenir says in response to the question. Oh, you'd like to watch Avatar The Last Airbender again for the first time. That's actually, I like that. Like to see something you love and experience it that first time. <laughs> kind of oh. eternal sunshine. So that then begs the question, <laughs> if you go, when you go back to this point in time, do you have you keep the context memory. of now with you? That's a good question. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, we're getting to a Mason, are we thinking far too deep into this question? No, well, welcome to philosophy chats where we ponder <laughs> the world and the universe's questions. <laughs> but, but then if you traveled back to when you didn't exist. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh, very deep. <sighs> okay. I do note like that self, answer, Mavenir. Note to self, like we don't answer. need any more deep questions on cloud chats. <laughs> Well, it looks like we have a Unix epic joke from. Oh, uh, there's all, there's always one. There's always one. <laughs> Can't travel before January first, nineteen seventy. Philosophy me, chats about space. Know. Yes, that's where we're at now. Mavner says, "Yeah, um, yeah." <laughs> philosophy chats about space uh love Kesh asks about this shirt so this is an internal do only shirt but it is my favorite shirt so hopefully one day we might be able to do them publicly i'm i'll have to bug i'll have to bug our swag people about it we should we should we should, we should put far more out there be nice we should yeah you, you yeah i if if you asked me the entire budget would be nothing but swag so that's why <laughs> they don't that's why they don't ask me anymore um <laughs> Okay, anyone else in chat got any funny? <laughs> okay, this one hits a little bit hard. Someone's like, let's go back to 2019. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <Ouch>. <laughs> that hits in the feels. Okay. I like Polina's answer. Go back and witness your birth or your first steps or some milestone in your life. It would be interesting to view yourself externally like that. Like... That okay, philosophy mm. brain boom. I, I would just start poking myself and be like, Hey, don't don't eat that or don't jump off that slide. That's bad bad news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. We'll we'll do the if you could give yourself one piece of advice question oh, next week. Yeah, we'll do yeah, that one next we'll do that one next week. I'm glad that we're getting away from the tech questions and into the more fun ones. So yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, now that we're done pondering the myths of the universe, let's move on to the news. So, uh, in this segment, we talk about all of the latest things that happen in news. Sometimes it's a slow week, sometimes it's a fast week. Based on the number of things in our segment, it was a pretty good week for news and tech this week. So, yeah. let's go ahead and just jump right into it. Uh, that's so, this week. Yeah. Uh, one of the big ones we had this week was out of the land of python and this is this is definitely coming up more and more in the news um a team at jfrog has detected malicious pypi packages that were stealing credit cards and if i remember correctly discord tokens yes. um which is interesting uh and this just really leads to you know a new a new form of it you know cybersecurity attack it's attacking supply chain and package indexes which is becoming increasingly more of a problem that we're seeing in the in the tech space uh, you know this is not the first time this has happened now but it's definitely becoming more and more prevalent 
I think, and maybe this is my uh, lack of not really doing much with Python. Python feels very open to this as well because, like, by standard, you're not pinning dependencies to a specific hash. Hmm. From what Depend I remember, unless you use an ex extra manager on top of just piping directly. Depend depends on what you're using. So if you're just using pip and you're just do like, that's a, that's the most loaded question on earth. Um, <laughs> If you're just doing like a requirements file and you're not actually pinning to a version, then yes, this could this could potentially get you in like upgrades. Yeah. But most of the time, most people will pip install and then use like f pip freeze and then freeze all of the requirements and then always install that version. That's one way to do it. Yeah. Then there's tools like poetry and pip env, which track not only your normal dependencies, but your transit dependencies. And it's getting all over the place. Like it, we're getting to really good pinning uh, practices in in Python now, more Absolutely. so than we were, let's say, ten years ago. Um, the problem is, it's just really hard to do security scans. It's hard and it's expensive to do security scans, especially when you're an open source, uh, you know, repository. Now they get donations from places. So, you know, full disclosure, I know like everyone that works on PyPI. Um, like I'm I'm pretty good friends with most of them. So. Uh, like they're doing the best they can. They're doing everything they can to do this, but this is just this has been so new lately. And like they've they trying to get the money to get people to work on this because you know this is a full time job to do this, and everyone who manages this is an open source volunteer. So yeah. you know, pay your open source maintainers, and you'll get better security. Yeah, but it's, it, yeah, it's scary to see, but it's also like to me at least completely expected. Like mm -hmm. packages are going to be doing malicious stuff if you don't vet them before you use them. Yes, and that is one thing that's actually been like, some of the security improvements they made is in, in the old PyPI, someone could delete a version and then re-upload with the same version number. That's no longer oh. the case anymore. Yeah, that, in the old, we're talking legacy system, you know, they relaunched PyPI, they rebuilt the whole thing from the ground up and I want to say like 2017, 2018, but in the old one, that used to be hosted on like Guido's lap, like the original version used to be hosted yeah. on Guido's desktop in his office and in uh, Holland or wherever he was from, um, you know, that one was really, <laughs> was really interesting. So there's a lot to unpack there. Um, the Python packaging authority is doing the best that they can, and there will be solutions to this in the future, but yeah, packages. Yeah. Woo. I mean, good as a J frog for, you know, going out mm -hmm. there and actually doing some scanning themselves and reporting this. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting. I wonder, do we see anything like this in the like NPM and like the node repositories and stuff? Malicious yeah. JavaScript? Less malicious and more just like every other day there's all sorts of just vulnerabilities and packages. Um, there's recently one in the core tar module that required a new version of NPM itself to be released in a new version of node. Um, so that's, that's more common than actual malicious packages being published, but Given the size of npm, I'm sure there are there will, there are some out there. Um, but doesn't npm has a like a vulnerability scanning feature? Um, yes, but that's not looking for malicious packages. That just kind of lets you know um, the version you have of a package has a known vulnerability, generally a CVE. Yeah, I think pipinf has that too. Um, I don't know if poetry does, but I've never I've never personally worked with poetry, so Oof, it's a weird time. <laughs> Check your source code. Make sure it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the advice for it. It's just you know check packages before you use them. Mm. Yeah, but that's a lot of work for a lot of people, especially if you're you know using yeah. a lot of them. Hooray! We this is why we can't have nice things. Indeed. So our next our next story comes out of the land of Wikimedia. So Vue.js has been selected by the Wikimedia Foundation for the future of JavaScript projects. Matt, tell us more about this. Yes, yeah, so this has this been. Way. This has been a thing that's been happening for a while. Um, kind of Wikimedia done a whole consultation process on what frame that framework they want to use going forward um, for any new platforms that they build, essentially. Um, and after, I think, like a year and a half? Yeah, a year and a half or more, um, they have settled on Vue.js as the framework that they'll be using going forward um, for any new platforms that they build. Which is pretty cool to see, you know. That's it's cool. it's definitely the smaller of the frameworks um, in terms of market share, so it's pretty pretty nice to see it being selected. Do they give any reasons as to why they chose this one? 
Undoubtedly, because it's Wikimedia. Uh, <laughs> after a year and a half consulta consultation process, I would hope they've got some strong reasons. I just haven't read into it far enough to uh, know those off the top of my head. Uh, the selected pilot was within desktop improvements project. Um, type ahead search. They mentioned type ahead search twice in here. What is type like, ahead search? Just a auto. If I had to guess, just like a auto completing search box, which I'm surprised that is so high on their list. I guess I makes so sense in the context but... of like Wikimedia, right? Most of their sites are all just about being able to find content. So I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, so it was you. a long consultation process, and they've set some view. What was the? Uh, did they use a framework prior to choosing Vue, like React or Angular or something else, or their own? I would guess it's their own, based on how old the core Wikimedia um, infrastructure is, because it's a mm -hmm. PHP app off the top of my head. And it's like what we're looking at here is the core core tool of it. Um, yeah, I'd imagine it's custom. But I've cool. never really poked into it. Matt, we need you to know everything about Wikimedia's tech stack, please. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe then if, 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 they, if they build out a completely new one on top of Vue, I might take some interest in it. Uh, <laughs> the old one, less so. <laughs> okay, well, our next story comes out of the land of ships and big things and containers, <laughs> Kubernetes. I couldn't think of a clever pun for that. Um, off the top of my head, Kim. Yeah, so yesterday Kubernetes version 122 was released. Uh, Kubernetes moved from, I think, four releases a year to three, um, but they always do a, a really good job of releasing them and, and letting us know what's new. This is a really big release um, uh, because there are some beta API, API removals. And so if you've used Kubernetes in the last year or so, moving to 1.16 was a huge release because a lot of APIs were removed. And so you could upgrade your cluster and try to deploy some uh, Kubernetes resources using those old APIs and it would break. So there was just a lot of work for that release. This looks similar. So deprecations and removals, uh, the ingress beta API, custom resource definition API, and certificate signing requests. I assume they, they went somewhere else. Uh, but some of the good stuff is pod security policies are being replaced by the admission controller. Um, so just being rolled into something else that exists. Uh, you can <laughs> run uh, your containers in rootless mode, which is good because running as root is like the biggest uh, security threat in, secure in Kubernetes. Um, yeah, and lots of other things. And Sysdig always puts out a great um, summary of the release. And yes, love cache, I'm happy now because there's Kubernetes news. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking at this, all the things that have been removed are uh, beta features right mm -hmm. okay i was like this is a minor version with breaking changes <laughs> okay so, no but okay so again well th this this do we put this in my giant list of people who don't follow simver rules um, <laughs> they've very strictly follow simver that's why i was asking i'm curious i'm cu okay i'm just curious when when and what kubernetes 2.0 is going to look like that's a great question i don't know the answer <laughs> Yeah, that'd be quite scary. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that it's scary. And then whenever anyone says Python four, everyone screams and runs in terror. <laughs> so maybe I'll just go forever on version one, and it'll be like, all right, yeah. we're at uh, one point four ninety five. All right. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm 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 not. I don't I don't think that's wrong. You know, <laughs> I don't either. And Even actually, it's such a core tool now and everything. Oh you know? yeah. This is a good segue into our next news item, which is about a major release. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, our next news item is major releases and why Simver annoys Mason. For people <laughs> who don't follow Simver annoys Mason. Uh, looks like Yarn 3.0 came out. Whoever wants to take this one, take it away. Chris, do you know much about Yarn? <laughs> uh, I used Yarn when it first came out. and Same. <laughs> It was awesome. And then the NPM and Node kind of brought a lot of those features in. They got a package lock. Um, I started seeing way less errors coming in from NPM. And then I went back to NPM. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so this is, 
I don't know. It's a surprise to me. I don't really know much about this one, but uh, if you are still using yarn, good to know about. Um, yeah. I think the main thing here that I'm looking at the list of breaking changes here, I would guess that the drop of no 10 is kind of what I would call the breaking change. And then the rest of them were added with that excuse on top. So yeah, if you're using no 10, yarn three is not for you. I wonder what it feels. I wonder what it feels like to build a tool like Yarn, which is an improvement on existing tooling like NPM. Be like, look, we did it. It's so good. And then your competitor is like, yeah, thank you. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sure it feels good in some way. Like flattery is the sincerest form of, uh, I don't even know how that phrase ends. <laughs> uh, it's, it's imitation is the sincerest uh, form of flattery. Yeah. Is, uh... But uh yeah, and then and then beyond that, right? Like, you're probably kind of stuck with the project. And I don't. I mean, yarn is probably really cool for whoever uses it still. But yeah, I, I didn't know it was still going. Well, yeah. it's it's also the like okay, we started using yarn. It's easier just to keep going than it is to to switch. Like people like people don't mm -hmm. switch technologies. And like I think we I think I, I heard our CEO say this one time. Um, people don't change technologies unless it brings more than two times the benefit of the original mm -hmm. technology mm -hmm. because all of the effort that it takes to switch everything over is so monumental and all the new learning and stuff that it has to be like like you have we have to have an amazing amount of benefit to even consider the change, which is why you know. Yeah, which is why people just stick with tools and you're like, why are you still using that? Well, I started using it 20 years ago and I don't feel like learning the new thing. So yep. that that rule applies to coding, right? Not like yearly phone models that everyone upgrades. <laughs> well, it it applies to, I guess, big kind of tech. Because like when you like I another one that I kind of like equate it to is like is kind of like electric vehicles. Like you it has to bring two times the value. Or people are like, oh, I've always just used, assuming not, you know, that is taking out the climate change issue, all of that. But like, if you were like, here are two, here's this vehicle, there's nothing wrong with it. And then there's this new electric car. It now takes you much longer to fuel up. There's less fueling stations. You know, it yeah. doesn't make logical sense. Now, if you were like, you fuel up in two seconds, you can fuel up while driving on the road and it takes you to Mars. You're like, whoa, that's way, that's way great. Let's do that. <laughs> I, I'm I'm it's impressed by the car. tech inside of the electric cars because honestly, like I'm a tech person and like every new gizmo and gadget they add is just awesome. So like you know like the auto drive feature and stuff that's yeah. going towards it. Um, it's also linked. We also talk about it when it comes to cloud providers. People don't move cloud providers unless the cost is significant or they're going to gain a lot of stuff because it's such a pain to move off of cloud providers. So that's mm -hmm. it's kind of. Some things, but I think like when you're going like the new version of the phone, I don't think that really qualifies there. I think that's well, just I mean, an upgrade. I, I would tech. say it almost does it. Like I have my iPhone eight still. It's got a knackered battery in it, but it doesn't last like five minutes unplugged. But I refuse to get the new iPhone because I like touch ID. Okay, well that's that's one thing. But like okay, but let's talk about maybe moving from Android to iPhone. Oh yes, yeah. Like, I mean, I just recently did that. That was like, and that, that was monumental. That took me, I had to talk myself into that for days. So. I, I learned a new word today. Knackered. Uh, knackered. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, oh, I, that, just, I, just broke, <laughs> I just broke my iPhone 8 and got an iPhone 11. So I feel you. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's just, I don't want to have to look at my phone eye to eye every time I unlock it. I mean, I like. There's a lot of this when I'm in bed, like, uh, it gets oh, it. <laughs> I, no, I don't, I don't, I don't use face. I don't use face ID stuff at all. Like I don't trust it. That's a, that's a, that's a paranoid rant for another day. Let's move on to the next thing in our news, <laughs> which is the Olympic medals this year were all made from recycled electronics. And that's actually a pretty cool story because if you know anything about recycling electronics and just hardboards, motherboards, why did I say hardboards? What on earth? Hard drives, motherboards, electronic stuff in general. There's a lot of rare earth metals built mm -hmm. in that we need. Um, and whenever these devices get thrown away, like if they if they go to landfills, that's a lot of rare earth metals just going to waste. I know a lot of people that like, or I don't know a lot of people. I've seen a YouTube channel of one person who goes into junkyards and pulls out old computers and literally mines them for the rare earth metals. 
um, and makes a pretty decent money, but you know, then you have to go dumpster diving and mm -hmm, not worth it. So uh, it's really cool to see that we're doing stuff with that because electronics recycling, I feel like is something that we don't talk about enough and it's not enough things that people do and we need to be doing it. Mm -hmm. So it's a personal pet peeve of mine. <laughs> uh, I believe if you read into this article here, all the metal in the metals this year was entirely sourced from electronics. Wow, that's amazing. Which is, I think, the first time it's happened. Um, I think reading into every every Olympics, the medals contain recycled metal from the host country. Oh. But I think this is the first time that they've been purely recycled metal. Are the medals pure? Like, is it is that really a pure gold medal or is that gold plating? So, no. As it says right there, pure silver with gold plating. But they are they have got actual gold on them and actual silver inside them. Okay. Well, it's really tiny. I can't see it from this distance. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yes. As it, the Olympic medals aren't just like aluminium painted. They're, they're proper medals. I love the way they say aluminium. It's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll quit one day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Poor Matt. He's getting a lot of flack. No, here. he's not. He's loving no, it. Not. He knows it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we say, well, I mean, we we say aluminum, so yeah. you know it's not like it's that. It's not like it's great. It just you sound way more sophisticated than all of us over here. So, uh, our next one comes out of the land of things you didn't know about yourself, <laughs> which is the Stack Overflow 2021 oh, Developer yeah. Survey is out. Which definitely, actually, not a lot in this really surprised me. There was one point that surprised me in like popular web frameworks, which was that Flask is more popular than Django. And I actually had to go look that up in other surveys and the Python specific survey that JetBrains does also corroborated that effect. So that was interesting to me. But yes, if you're interested in stats, uh, if you're in any sort of developer marketing or you just want to know what everyone else in the world is doing, come look at the Stack Overflow developer survey. I think it had like 83,000 respondents. Um, yes. Which was pretty, in, which was, that's a, that's a pretty decent sample size. Yeah. Uh, to your um, your Flask and Django point, actually, I was very shocked by a very similar thing. They have a a circular uh, graph diagram thing in mm -hmm. here of like mm -hmm. what framework you use and what framework you want to be using. Mm -hmm. And Flask and Django are both completely isolated. Hmm. Those really? using Django only want to use Django. Those using Flask only want to use Flask. There was no overlap between either of those two or any of the others. Really, I did not look at that one, but that's interesting. I mean, you know, it might like there's a lot of people building AI ML stuff and you need a web front end. Like you might you might need a front end to actually like run the model, like once you actually have the model built. So if you're trying to be a mono, you know, a mono shop, like a mono language shop, it would kind of make sense to build mm -hmm. and build it to integrate into it. There you go. Flask and Django just on their own. One thing that I is think... so weird. Oh, sorry, Kim. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. I'm gonna switch subjects. Uh, so what, I think one thing that's interesting about all these surveys we look at is they usually call out like, "This is the sample of respondents, and here's some information about them." So in this survey, 91.67% of the people who responded identified as a man. Um, and uh 58 percent white or of european descent and i would love to see uh surveys that seem more global um or where more uh women and non-binary folks respond um so uh, i appreciate stack overflow calling that out saying like we'd mm -hmm. like to have a more diverse set of respondents um but something to keep in mind that all of this survey data um is only showing us uh, information about the people who responded. Yeah, and I know I, I've taken this in the past, but I didn't take it this year. And I'm not sure if it's because I was in between jobs and I wasn't on my computer much, or if I was like, I don't feel like doing that I right now. I don't recall doing this one either. Actually, I don't either. I'm. I don't, I'm, I don't recall I hearing it. about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Chris, I'm could you press the uh, professional developers filter again on this one? Oh. That is a shame. Both Flask Nobody and Django are not professional. Huh. Really? I know a lot. Well, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. You know, I don't agree with that. No, but... not, not do I, but I just thought it was very funny. Just but if you, now, but also, says that I'm professional. 
but if you look at this, if you look at it though, like people using Spring also don't want to go anywhere else. So mm. if you're stuck in Java land, which is interesting that Spring's here, but Tomcat isn't. So it kind of makes me think that Tomcat or Drop Wizard, it seems like Spring is like the dominant Java web framework. Yeah. And no one wants to talk about Java. So we'll move on to the next topic. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a little bit of uh, competitor news here. So Hetzner is increasing prices for additional IPv4 addresses. Um, this does not surprise me. This was going to come eventually that IPv4 addresses are out. Uh, like they're, they're out. There's no more. Eventually they are going to become very expensive. Um, and then, yeah, yeah. So I think the only clarification here is just, this is only additional IPv4 addresses. The pricing change doesn't affect the original IPv4 address that gets allocated to your box. Yes. Uh, I don't know yeah. what Hetzner is. Are they a cloud, cloud yes. provider? Like, okay, Europe, AWS European? Cloud European provider? question mark? I don't know if they have DCs elsewhere. Um, <laughs> but they're kind of very much more bare metal um, provider. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, we have a question in chat. What is DigitalOcean? DigitalOcean has both IB, IPv4 and IPv6. Um, and fun fact, to my knowledge, DigitalOcean was one of the first, if not the first, to offer IPv6 on on uh, compute resources. They, they had it early. And if your question um, is more, what is DigitalOcean as a company? We're a cloud hosting provider. <laughs> exactly. Just in yes. case you're asking that one. <laughs> in case you're asking that question, yes. Um, and our last piece of news today is coming out of the land of deprecation. Uh, AWS is retiring EC2 Classic uh networking which is great um and if you're still on it please move um or you just won't be able to are they so matt are they completely retiring it like you have to move or yes is my understanding it's been deprecated for a while and i think things are just going to stop working yeah and by deprecated for a while more than a decade um yeah AWS has given you more than enough time to move off of the off of this. So if you are on it, move. If you don't know, you're not on it. Yes, <laughs> um, I that's, you'll be that's how this works. Yes, like it, you have to do very. You had to do very specific things to get the classic uh, EC2 stuff. Um, yeah. When you there, there it. is a list of identifiers in the post. If you want, do you want to check if any of the EC2 instances are classic ones? Yes. I, I think they've also got a CLI tool for this as well. You know, yeah. classic AWS. I That's would be nice. willing to bet that your resources are not EC2 classics. Yes. <laughs> well, I like those scripts though, and that you can just run the script and it's like, no, you're fine. Or like, uh oh, this resource uses that thing that's going to be deprecated. <laughs> but you know, also like, I'm not sure we should be encouraging people to just run random, ran, run random scripts off the internet, that's especially fair. when the only output is just, you're fine. <laughs> you're fine. I've installed a rack, but you're fine. Uh, you mean we shouldn't just copy and paste all the code we see off a of Stack Overflow map? Going back to I the mean... developer survey. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Also, to whoever one of my funny co hosts or moderators were who tried to rickroll me, you didn't win. <laughs> Wait, you'll get, you've removed it. I of course I removed it. I wasn't gonna let you rick roll. It was me. actual news though. Like, yes, I tried to rick roll you in the document, but it is actual news. <laughs> it is never actual gonna, news. Never gonna give you up has crossed one billion views on YouTube, and it made oh. it to the top of Hacker News a couple of days ago. <laughs> oh, okay. Actual well, the link to it was the actual thing, and I thought I was being rick rolled, so I'm like, no, I don't feel like dealing with this. But I yes. would like to point out for the record, I got Kim in our planning meeting. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ooh, what is this? <laughs> Matt put something like a very cool video. <laughs> like, yeah, and I was like, that's how, I, that's how I knew it was suspicious. It was very cool video on YouTube. And I was like, I I grew up in the early 2000s. I remember these kind of links. <laughs> okay, well, that's all the time we have for the news today. And now we're going to move on to true or false. Uh, let me share my screen real quick. Um, true or false, if you are new to the thing, new to our program, is a fun little game that I play with my co-hosts and all of you. So if you want to play along, go to Kahoot.it and enter the pin that you see on your screen. 
um, for a chance to win Sammy stickers. And today's theme is tech history. We're going back in time and we're going to do some tech history stuff. So that once again, uh, if you want to play Kahoot, let me get the banner. Oh, there's the banner. Uh, and you want a chance to win a Sammy sticker pack, which will be mailed to you. Go ahead and join go by going to Kahoot.it and typing in the pin. And while we wait, Kim is going to give us the word of the week. Kim, take it away. Yes, the word of the week this week is FQDN, uh, which stands for Fully Qualified Domain Name. And so a fully qualified domain name um, has all of the parts. And so an example would be www.digitalocean.com and then a period at the end. And so uh, what that domain name is telling you is the first part, uh, which is usually www if you're on the internet, it could be FTP, it could be mail, um, that's identifying the host name. And then the next part uh, in the DigitalOcean example would be DigitalOcean, or it could be Google, or it could be XKCD, that's the domain. Uh, the part after that, uh, .com, .io, .net, that's the top level domain name. And then the trailing period at the end, and that's the thing we don't see very often, um, indicates that the string right before the period is the top level domain. So uh, FQDN, uh, honestly, the way that I've used it at work is just being like, oh yeah, I gotta have a period at the end of that um, of that address. So yeah, anything to add, Chris, Matt, Mason? Not particularly, just the up here, FQDN and hostname kind of very interchangeably used. Mm. Generally the same thing. Yes, yes. I, I, in my brain, I think of FQDNs as the absolute path for a website. Yes. Nice. <laughs> so, um, but yes, we could almost have made, made named this section acronym of the week because if there's <laughs> one thing, one thing that tech has a lot of, it is acronyms that don't make a lot of sense and confuse a lot of people. Yeah. Especially it's when there's, there. especially when the there's acronyms that have two meanings. <laughs> Well, that happens quite a bit, yeah. Oh, it's awful. I hate it. Okay, well, if you're going to join in, remember, we're going to play a game. We're going to start in. I'm going to give it, we'll give it a minute. Uh, but remember, Sammy stickers. And, you know, you get to put on your resume that you want a true or false thing on Cloud Chats. And that gets everybody hired. So Basically, the bit you haven't told us yet, though. What's the theme this week? I did tell you, but I'll did tell you, you again. It's tech listening? history. You oh. are not listening. We're not talking listening. about tech history this week. We're going back in time and going to talk about How some far? of the technological <laughs> events um, as far as I wanted to go. But there is some space stuff, so you should be fine on those questions. <laughs> okay. So I just always... I want to I want to call out this comment from Mauricio, which is: Is it just me, or does anyone else wonder how Matt looks? And I know I, Samantha and I know we've. I seen do not Matt. know. I've worked <laughs> with Matt for three months now, and I do not know what he looks like. There are people that have worked with Matt for years <laughs> that do not know what Matt looks like, but Samantha nope. and I, we saw we saw the <laughs> we, we saw the dodo bird in the wild, and we were like, oh, take a picture. <laughs> so. Uh, hopefully if we ever get to get together as a company again for like an all, like a company, all, uh, all hands or something, we'll, we'll get to see Matt I'm, again. No, next time, next time that happens, I'm getting a, you know, a life-size cutout of me, <laughs> of digital me. I'm just going to wrap myself in that. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. We're going to go ahead and move on with the game. So let's, let's get started with question number one. We are using Kahoot, by the way. Also, if you're just now joining in, you can join it at any time. Depending on how bad everyone does, you might still win. <laughs> True or false, the Apple Lisa was the world's first commercial computer with a graphical user interface. A tiny little picture of the Apple Lisa. So, uh, it's a very what, tiny little picture. <laughs> yeah, well, sometimes Google's different. Uh, the Apple Lisa was the Apple Lisa, the world's first computer with a graphical interface, first commercial computer, I should say. And this is true. It was the first, again, I think the key word here is going to be commercial. There may have been some beforehand, uh -huh. but the one first commercially available was the Apple Lisa. Um, work began on the Apple Lisa in 1979 with a targeted completion date of 1981 and a sticker price of $2,000. That deadline was completely missed, like all things in tech, <laughs> and it was released in 1983 for a price of $10,000. So two years and $8,000 later, 
you could get an Apple Lisa. How did that? Do you know how that lined up to pricing of other devices at the time? Oh, that I don't even like know. What, I don't even know what would have been out. Computers were expensive back then, so you yeah. have to remember in the early days of tech, um, like we're talking like eighties, like late seventies, early eighties. Com companies actually thought they were going to make all of their money on hardware, and they gave away all the software for free. Like that was the original business model of the tech industry was we're going to convince people to buy these really expensive machines and we're going to make all of our profit off of that. And we'll just give away all the software because no one will ever want to actually pay for software. Um, and we see how that has flipped. <laughs> well, now they, the, oh, uh, I said, as always, I'm going to change the subject slightly. Um, wasn't the first uh, computer with a graphical user interface, the Xerox Alto? Um, it was never commercially released, but it was like the first. So first yes, and there's the big thing that you know, like whenever people say that my, that Microsoft just stole Apple because when they built that, Apple just stole from Xerox. So yes, Xerox was the first graphical one, but it was not commercially available. Okay, next question is the first. Oh, I missed the whole. The first photograph of a star was taken in the middle of the 19th century. Was the first so for those, that means 1801 to 1899? Um, because I always mess that up. Um, this is true. So the first photograph was taken, and for some reason in my notes, I didn't put the date, so now you have to just believe me. Um, <laughs> the first photograph of a star was taken at the Harvard Observatory. The photograph was Vega in the Lyra constellation, the second brightest star in the nor Northern Hemisphere. And if I remember correctly from when I was writing this, uh, it was photographed in 18, the eight, early 1850s. Hmm. So, I yes. presume, like, when we say photograph of a star, like, photograph specifically of that star for, like, scientific purposes. First photograph of a star. In general, just because you remember, like the the like photographs weren't invented in like around that time, like mm -hmm. and being able to take a photograph of one with that really long exposure time, you know, it wasn't really possible to get like sky and stuff at that point. So I guess it's maybe the first scientific photograph. Yeah, so it's like I was, I was gonna say, like presumably we've taken photographs before that had stars in the background. <laughs> well, 1850. I mean, the camera was just coming out then. Yeah. Like so, it's still relatively early. How's it Next question. Then? Oh, too fast. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. The first version of Internet Explorer was released in 1992. Is this true or false? When was the first version of Internet Explorer released? Oh, is the next Early. one. When was the last version released? <laughs> <laughs> no, because there's still people that have IE6 on their desktop to make sure they can work with old legacy software. This was false. It's a little bit early. Microsoft introduced Internet Explorer on August 16th, 1995, which at the time was a modified version of Spyglass Mosaic, which was a Netscape product, um, if I remember correctly, um, which Microsoft had licensed. So later, when Microsoft began including Internet Explorer with for free within Windows, Spyglass sued Microsoft for not paying what they felt were proper royalties. Microsoft settled for $8 million. So tech history who's doing well smooth wombat up at the top kind unicorn close behind nobody else in the vicinity we well, should take this opportunity to remind you the game is not just about getting it right it's about speed the yes. faster you get it right the better are either of y'all smooth unicorn or kind wombat or other way around smooth not wombat kind unicorn good i'm glad that my hosts aren't doing as well now that we've uh switched it over to where it gets on their phone and they don't have to wait on the stream delay hmm. ah Next question. Linus Torvalds posted a message to an internet news group on August 25th, 1991. This would be considered the birth of Linux. Oh. It's a great That's stock a photo. Image. <laughs> Andrew, Andrew Mulkey says that he is smooth wombat. And that is good. You're doing well. Must know a lot about tech history. Or are really fast at Googling. <laughs> no Googling is cheating. Yeah, no Googling. It's cheating. No, no. Uh, this is true. Linus Torvalds posts a message to the internet news group comp.os.minix with the subject line, what would you like to see most in Minix? Minix is another POSIX compliant Unix that would be the inspiration for U Linux, and it is still being released in an active productivity today. Like, it's still being developed. So it was, and that's where Linux came from. You could make that into a very good limerick. 
I believe. I probably could. There's a <laughs> lot of rhyming in there. Linux, oh. <laughs> Posix, Linux. <laughs> Smooth Wombat and Kind Unicorn still there, but Quick Squid, Joyful Badger, and Silly Penguin are coming up. <laughs> Silly Penguin. <laughs> Silly Penguin. Next question. The world's first search engine was made in the late 1980s. Was the world's first search engine made in the late 1980s? I'm hoping it's that Jeeves character. <laughs> yeah. Alta Vista. <laughs> This is false. This was actually made again. I didn't copy the date, so I'm going to Google it real quick because I'm doing a bad job. Like I wrote all just, this you stuff. Just yeah, got me. Believe me. Oh well, I got it. Okay, I, fi I figured it out. There it is. There it is. Got it. Okay, so the world's first primitive search engine was started, and I didn't copy the date. On September second, nineteen ninety three, it was known as W three Catalog or the CUI Dub 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 Catalog. And it was started by Oscar, I can't say that last name, at the Center CUI of University of Geneva. Okay, Center University de Informatique. So the did search it, lasted for about three years before modern search engines began to appear. Did it become anything or did it kind of just die out and get replaced? Uh, I don't think it became anything. It's so old they don't even have pictures of it. <laughs> oh. So. Nice. Love I was it. hoping you were going to say like it was, it was the uh, grandfather of Google or something. I no, actually, I don't think that. I don't think it was. So smooth wombat, kind unicorn, still up at the top, but people are gaining. Here we go. Next question: The first computer bug was a cockroach that got trapped in the relay of the Harvard Mark II. And also, that is the coolest looking little picture. <laughs> so, was the first computer bug a cockroach that got trapped in the relay switch of the Harvard Mark II? Oh, this is false. I got you with my over specificity. <laughs> it was not a cockroach. It was a moth. Oh, this and this, but, this Grace is, Hopper pulled it out. <laughs> yes, I think Grace Hopper did. I think Grace Hopper did pull it out. It is still on display in the Smithsonian. They sealed it and wrote like the original text, like bug in the code. And it is on display in the Smithsonian. You can go see the very first computer bug. So the rest which... of the sentence is correct. It was just a moth, not a cockroach. Yes. <laughs> What know a, your, know what your that, bugs. What if that moth knew if it was like, I'm going to change everything and now we're Could like, change I have to the, debug my code. Going to change the etymology of the entire <laughs> English language by go, like <laughs> by being the martyr. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, no one moved in our leaderboard. That's interesting. Excellent. Got you. Next question. The first known use of emoticons or emojis was in 1992. Oh, those emojis have bugged out eyes. This is false. This is actually this was actually done uh so in a posting made to a Carnegie Mellon bulletin board, Professor Scott Fallman proposes the first known use of emoticons, also known as smileys or emojis. The one that is listed there, the colon hyphen close parenthesis, was actually the first emoji. And this was proposed in on September 19th, 1982. So we have been moving slowly back towards hieroglyphics for a very long time now. <laughs> I'm going to change my... Uh... Hello world question to I would go back in time to see this guy pitch emojis. Oh yeah. I like <laughs> I like this revision. I like this. It is nice. Yes. Up oh, smooth wombat and kind unicorn. Here we go. Eight out of ten. Microsoft Word 1.0 was released in September of 1983 for use with MS DOS compatible systems. Perfect. <laughs> oh, do you like my little gif? I, I do. Yeah. The question is, is that animated or is it a recording? It's a it's a gif, I don't know. It probably is animated. I doubt that's a recording. That it's moving to I'd like to think it's a sped up recording. They got a dog touch to do that. Good. Everyone got this one right because I'm assuming everyone just guessed true. Uh yes, this was true. The first yeah. version of Word was released 
and for MS DOS, Microsoft Word, in on September of 1983, Word was the first word processing software to make extensive use of the computer mouse. Not hmm. coincidentally, Microsoft had released a computer mouse for IBM compatible PCs earlier in the year. A demo version was included for free with a copy of PC World magazine, marking the first time a floppy disk was ever included with a magazine. I would like to do a plug before we go on. So go ahead. I think it's I think it's closed to in-person visitors, but there's a museum in Seattle called the Living, uh, oh God, the Living History of Computers or the Computer Living History Museum. And you used to be able to go and they had all these things like a Xerox Alto, uh, like an Apple Lisa, like all of these computers throughout history, including mainframes that you could go and like type on. Um, oh, but check out their to... website. It's so cool. You can, request uh, like login credentials and they'll connect you sometimes with SSH, sometimes with a protocol that's older than SSH to get to like, get into those systems and, and poke around. So you can like play the original Oregon Trail and it's so cool. So- Oh, that the, does sound cool. It's very cool. Uh, let me look it up, the actual name, the Living Computer Museum. Yeah, it's just called Living Computers. <laughs> Awesome. Next question, because we've got to move on because we're behind on time. Midway <laughs> released the video game Pac-Man to North American arcades in 1980. So did Midway release the video game Pac-Man to North American arcades in 1980? And just a note on the previous topic, if you're in the UK, uh, the Computing History Museum in Cambridge is available nice. as well. Very cool. This was true. Midway released the video game Pac-Man to arcades in North America in 1980. While the Japanese release under the name Puck-Man occurred in May of that year, the game's popularity didn't take off until being released in the United States. Pac-Man will become the first true mega-hit video game in history, sparking Pac-Man fever and catapulting the video game industry into mainstream culture. So we can thank Pac-Man. What a legacy, yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Next question. Final question. Last question. The original iPod had a two gigabyte hard drive. Did the original iPod have a two gigabyte hard drive? Oh my gosh, is there an actual picture of it, the original iPod? It is not. <laughs> I I probably could have found one, but I was being lazy and this was the only one that came up in the clip art. So or in the whatever they use. This is mm -hmm. false. So using the slogan, a thousand songs in your pocket, Steve Jobs introduced the original iPod featuring a five gigabyte hard drive, oh. Firewire connectivity and synchronization to iTunes on the date that I didn't write down because I'm bad at this. Wow. <laughs> <sighs> Uh, using a 1.8 inch drive, the iPod was significantly smaller than the competing MP3 players of the time. But if you remember, they were like that big, like they were 1. still pretty big. 1.8 inch drive. Inch. You implied that this is actually a mechanical drive. Yes, it was. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Matt, things that happened probably before, well, you were probably born at this point. I was, so. yeah, a young child. <laughs> Yes, but they, I mean, they were big, like, so they were that thick and they were like that big. They were really clunky, but yeah, so now if, that I think about it, it would have been a hard spinning enough, drive. Would it just, you know, stop working? I, I don't know. <laughs> Probably not as bad as a CD player did, so people mm, were okay yeah. with that. You know, people were used to not shaking or banging their devices around at that yeah. time because Whereas of the nowadays, that's, CD you know, player. Just, it's not yeah. working. I'll throw it across the room for a bit. Smooth Wombat, you are the winner. Take a pic screenshot of your screen that has your name on it or phone thing that says Smooth Wombat and email Mason at Mason. Uh, Wait, what? Yeah, Mason at DigitalOcean.com. <laughs> I was giving the wrong email address. So take a screenshot of your first place win and email it to Mason at DigitalOcean.com. You would think I would copy this out before. Uh, and be sure to include your shipping info and by shipping info i mean all of your shipping info because people seem to forget like i need your postal code i need everything like yeah yes and that is all the time we have today for our lightning or sorry no our true or false game next we're moving on to our lightning tutorial which i have to do quickly but luckily it will be pretty quick so today i will be doing our lightning tutorial because DigitalOcean release some new stuff and it's cool woo woo so my goodness my phone is blowing up 
<laughs> over here when it's going on. So the thing that DigitalOcean has released recently that is cool is now we support, we now have CentOS Stream and the new version, Rocky Linux, as default images that you can do for your droplets. If you do not remember uh, CentOS, uh, or, or if you did not hear, a couple of months ago, CentOS announced that they would no longer be performing the CentOS project the way that you know it used to be held, which was basically a, a community clone of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. They're moving into CentOS Stream, which is more of an upstream ready to go. I don't know what the difference between CentOS Stream and Fedora is. Maybe Fedora is more bleeding edge and CentOS Stream is less bleeding edge, but that's kind of weird. So you can use CentOS Stream if you'd like, but also Rocky Linux is the fork of CentOS because so many people like CentOS. And going forward, if you want old school CentOS, like, you know, stable community enterprise Linux, then Rocky Linux is a good one to go to if you're not already using something like an Ubuntu LTS or Debian. I've actually never worked with Debian, not going to lie. And I'm going to go ahead and deploy these on our premium droplets. If you haven't seen our premium droplets, they now they are a newer processor, newer architecture. So you can now get Intel and AMD. But not only that, you have much faster uh, speeds because we are using NVMe SSDs instead of SSDs. Just regular SSDs. If you're unaware of NVMe SSDs, they... I, Matt and Matt might be able to back me up on this one. Um, they're just they they integrate directly into the motherboard, right? So they're a lot quicker than like SATA line. Yeah, they <laughs> use PCIe instead of SATA. So yes, so basically I'll an NVMe SSD is a PCIe thing. So you'll get much. You're just going to get you know better performance out of it at only you know instead of my normal five dollar droplet for six dollars, I get a quicker droplet and a quicker, uh, quick you know faster disk. More powerful thing, and if I want AMD, we're going to go with AMD on so Rocky Linux. Lots of CPU as well, um, and the product docs have specs on CPUs if you're interested. Yes, so we'll create a droplet, which will take you know droplet create times, usually pretty quick, especially on the small ones. Do 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 <laughs> do. Oh, yeah, the Dude. Yeah, I, I need to get some elevator music for this. So whenever <laughs> we're doing this, we're sitting here waiting. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and go. copy that. And let's pull up a terminal real quick. Oh, next not, up yet. not up yet. <laughs> Drop it. There, there it is. But it hasn't booted yet. Yep. If you... <laughs> there it goes. And you name dash A... Linux, Rocky Linux, on right. running on AMD, because this is an AMD droplet. So that is actually all we have today for this. That's the shortest uh, that was great. lightning tutorial we've done, but they'll be, you know, I like it, fun, easy to remember. And now we're moving on to a new section that I don't even have music for. Um, so I'm wow. just going to hum quietly in the background <laughs> um, as we move on to site review. So two people submitted, three people submitted uh, sites for us to review. And Chris is going to lead us in this section as Chris and Matt and whoever wants to jump in, review your site and talk to you about it. So hopefully y'all are still here in the chat. Chris, it's yours. You're muted. Yes. So let me share my screen. We have four sites for you today. Uh, four sites of all of you that jumped into that Google form. Uh, and I think we can put the Google form in the chat. So if you do want a site review, you can drop it into this form and we'll add you to the next segment. But let me share my screen. This is the first one we have, which is Task Ord. Uh, and if you are the creator of Task Ord in the chat, say, hey, interesting name, Task Ord. Is that, uh, is that how you say it? Task Ord. Ta like Discord, oh, yeah, Task Ord? This is a clean site. I'd say task ord, yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, all right. Well, let's figure out what this is first. Build in public, uh, get support from makers by publicly sharing, increase productivity, and earn reputation. So it's, let's see, questions, tasks. It's a community to share what you're currently working on. That would be my take, yeah. It seems to be kind of just a community built around open source contributions? Question mark? Mm. Yeah. I initially took it as like almost a product hunt, but yeah, seeing this first yes. one being... 
I think, yeah, it's product hunt, but more direct to GitHub. Mm. I like the party yeah. part. That stands out to me. Yeah. The, so when we talk about uh, site reviews, right, the first thing is where do you draw the user's eye to? I guess we're doing a design review. Um, well, yeah, it's part of it, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I would say definitely maybe clean this up. I uh, The reading of it being so wide and then this uh, could take a little bit more precedence. So maybe increase the size on that. Maybe for these future ones, we can just go inspect element and just start changing CSS. But um, <laughs> yes, the eye does go straight to party parrot, which pulls it away from all of this over here. Uh, let's see, badges. I mean, badges yeah. are cool. So I'm like, I'm fine with my eye being drawn there. I like the badges as well. Let's go find badges. Okay, so nice badges, and you can add your own badge. So this, oh, what does this feel like? What does this remind me of? Um, oh, polywork. Hmm. Yes. Um, they, I mean, I'm not the the. I think we should make this just a whole polywork. compare to other products, but <laughs> yeah. what it reminds me of. <laughs> Okay, so I guess we should look at the. This is interesting. I I took badges as like rewards that you would get automatically from uh, activities, but you can uh, assign them to yourself, kind of like labels. Products are here. Love the UI here. That looks great. Questions are here. Uh, yeah, it looks like a really cool community. Yeah. I mean, like the the design is clean. Um, yes, very. There's nothing that makes me go, oh, this looks really quite wrong. This looks great. Cool. Okay. Yeah, maybe we'll see it on uh, Product Hunt pretty soon. I think, I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Go ahead, Kim. Sorry. Oh, it just looks like there's a lot of features, you know. Looks like you can create an account, um, give yourself badges, uh, interact with other users. Like, there's a lot going on. This is cool. Yeah, so I think my feedback would just be that headline on the homepage, make it a bit bigger and maybe explain more about what it is. Cause I think like between the three of us, we struggle a bit to initially figure out what the site is. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good feedback. There is a lot going on and that's the problem when you have so many cool features is trying to guide people one by one through your features. Uh, cool. So that's I mean, awesome at, at the site. same time though, yeah. having all the activity on the homepage is really cool to see. Like, yeah. It immediately tells me this is an active site that's got like use lots of users on it. So like don't yes. hide that stuff. Yes. So I just pulled up the next one. It actually is pretty similar in style and purpose, I think. So this is oh, Dev is Party. Yeah. Dev Party. Is this the one that wasn't working when we checked this it? This is the one what, that last wasn't week? working earlier in the week. Yeah. Yes. This one wasn't working whenever I was putting it in the thing. So it looks like something um, running now. Yeah, up and running. I do like the skeleton loaders. Interesting because there, there's that study where it's like if you just don't put a skeleton loader, people think the site is faster than if you did put one. Hmm. Because then it immediately tells them in their mind, oh, it is loading. That means it has to load. Whereas mm -hmm. if there was nothing there, it's just like they were just... Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree that. I, I still prefer having a skeleton loader though. Like, one, it's it solves the issue of um, CLS for Google. Like when that loads in, there's not going to be a massive mm -hmm. job page because there's already a skeleton of the right size there. Um, and I think that also plays into visually for the person on the site. Like it's not a massive visual jump for them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I like skeleton loaders, especially for like when you've interacted like search and there's mm -hmm. populated search items. Um, really love this text gradient. Oh, how did that mean done? Ah, Tailwind. Clip. Yes. Yeah. Clip. Uh, so this gets the background, and then you clip it to the text with background clip text. And so if you remove background clip text, you get this giant. Chris, you can probably oh, cool. confirm this. Are these Tailwind mm -hmm. classes? These are Tailwind classes, yes. Cool. Um, and yeah, so Tailwind lets uh, you make these gradients pretty easily. You go background gradient to right and then you go from the one color to uh your other color right here. oh with a color in the middle yeah with yeah, a I color like in the middle the gradient on the 
like the banner or the very top uh mm -hmm. like there oh yes i like the left aligned um description of what this is the only developer social platform my eye definitely goes there <laughs> Yeah, I, I dig that. Maybe Taskord could use something like that as well, like a one-liner like statement. Mm. Yeah. Cool. All right, so number three is bfm.my. Let's let this load up. Ooh, cool. Which is a radio cool. I love that these sites are already like populated and rolling. I didn't know .my. Oh, is that Malaysia, the top-level domain? Yes, my guess would be that is correct. Nice. <laughs> but obviously, you know, actually, this might be a Malaysian site. <laughs> yeah. But um, .my definitely doesn't get used primarily for that anymore, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Pride of uh, Malaysia and highlights. It it looks like it. Super cool. Uh, looks like you've got some solid content. Uh, I like the grid. I like the bold kind of colors, actually. Like It's a definitely a different design style compared mm -hmm. to what we've been looking at, but I, I like it. With the tags? Yeah, well, just hard edges, um, really mm -hmm. kind of saturated colors. Yeah. Yeah, this um, this like constrained width kind of brings it back to I don't know, websites like this from maybe 10 years ago, but I feel like it's making a comeback. Mm -hmm. hmm. I'm not the biggest fan. Everyone's doing like this giant full width websites where they just go to edge to edge, and then if you're like zoomed in you get to see like that uh, yeah so yeah uh, yeah it's, it, it's an inconvenience for people with big monitors i'd rather and i don't quite understand where we do it because it's more design work for you as well because you've got to then have the consideration in place for if someone's looking at me on an ultra wide my content's going to be right on the left and i might have some right aligned stuff that's like 90 degrees over to the right <laughs> so yeah having a constrained container like this makes sense yeah and I do love the um, player on the bottom. Whoa. Oh, nice. Ooh. I like the schedule. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I'm thinking maybe we should have something like this for cloud chats on the site. <laughs> we should. I'm down. <laughs> and tech talks. Yeah. Ask me again in three months, maybe. <laughs> I'll build it okay. for you. <laughs> Theory. Is that a reminder? Cool. Well, it looks like uh, this was Salison, Salison's site going undergoing a redesign. So just one of the another another set of opinions. Oh, right on. Yeah, Salison, did you want us to focus on anything specific? Definitely keep the player bar. Um, yeah, I think that's a great move. Gotta say, given it's radio as well, and you can listen online, makes sense to kind of really push that forward. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, and on these, maybe like put the put the play buttons immediately on here, so it's easier to just get right into it. Mm -hmm. But overall, like half the battle, well, more than half the battle is the content, and you've got the content, so now you just get to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. That's great. I, Ooh, I, yeah. I, I actually struggle to like give feedback. This is yeah, a functional site that serves its purpose. <laughs> I love that it did the job. Okay, so check it out. This is the last one we're doing today. Topleading.net, keeping track of the world's best. I have. I feel like that should end this. And <laughs> I think I think that's the whole point. Is it? It's kind of just everything, right? Keeping track of the world's best. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah maybe a, an ellipsis there. I don't know. Um, no, no, I think best in, in uh, oh, English is not a strong point, in the noun sense of best. Okay. So maybe cap. I don't know why I have such a hang up on that. <laughs> oh, no, no, I agree. It kind of, it does trip you up very slightly, but I think actually it, it does kind of work. It makes you think. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, do no, love no. the tagline next to the logo, though. I Eyes like went straight that. to it. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. It says the technology, people, business, education, and more. And oh, I like these uh, top featured, top latest, top leading. 
I have a theory here that this is Tailwind. It is. Um, how how do you know? The Chris font is so is, good. Yeah, the font. <laughs> I I'm a big fan of like I'm a big nerd font nerd. Um, cool. <laughs> and this I think will be Inter. Yeah. Nice. Oh, everyone's using Inter. Yeah, Inter. Great font. <laughs> we we use Inter. Yeah, yeah we do. I did use Inter. Oh, we did. Um, we use it in our slide deck. <laughs> yeah. Wait, did we change it? We have we a new did. font. If you go to the homepage, it's now a different font. It's works. Oh no, I just got done changing stuff. Okay, whatever. <laughs> oh. Interesting. Uh, Chris, if you go back to that site again, uh, the one thing I noticed was you were kind of moving your mouse around on the homepage. Um, there's a hover effect on these cards, which seems very odd because it's not clickable. I can't interact uh, with that card, but it's doing a hover thing when you hover on it. It makes me think it is clickable. Yes, that that's a good point. Um, Matt, would you recommend the hover effect go over the links, or does no hover hover? Effect? I would personally just not have a hover effect. I think, um, or either that, or actually make the card clickable, and maybe go to a more featured. fleshed out list with more featured articles or something. Yeah. Um, I do like the the buttons here. the The thing with this is there's so many. There's three columns, and each column has about ten links. So it's like mm -hmm. not entirely sure which to to go for. So it's uh, a lot I just of went programming up from yeah, yeah. So, so maybe instead of having those two sets of links in the cards, just get rid of those links and kind of convert those cards into big buttons almost. Yeah, kind of like this. These things. Mm hmm. Mm. Um, I like the icons. The gradient is super hot right now. I didn't realize that till just now. <laughs> yeah, those are good. That third icon feels a bit out of place. There you go. There's some yes, a nice bit of feedback. I think that'll be iconfinder.com where you get those. Um, and then how do you feel about first name last name on email subscribes? Uh. <sighs> I think it's actually okay. I mean, I, I get where you're going with. It's just it doesn't cater to international audiences quite as well. Um, but I think a lot of people kind of just have got used to it at this point. And I think it works right. You know, it doesn't I, it doesn't have to be like I maybe you can word the placeholders better. But a first name of some sort, you know, what do you want the marketing emails or whatever else is to address you as? Yeah. It's so like for me, it's Matt. So I put Matt in there and the emails will then probably say, hi, Matt. Um and last name maybe you put may change maybe change that to other names or something. Um, yeah, but I think having I, two fields makes sense. I guess I was leaning more to like just drop them all together. Um, hmm. But I do, but see marketing the value in having it for marketing emails. I just <laughs> do hate there. Can you click the take survey button? Ooh. Oh, interesting. Uh, put on click. the survey below to participate. Oh, so. so is this how they curate the lists? By having surveys go? I don't know. Oh, It looks like a Google form. Okay. Maybe that's how they do it. Yeah. One feedback here is now this is clickable, but the card still isn't, so I would increase the size of that A tag. Yeah. Just take up the whole card. Um. Cool, uh, I think. Oh, also, your content here is uh, actually it's not feedback about the content, but site design. Your footer is not pinned to the bottom, um, and your mm. content is too short to make it be at the bottom. So you need probably some flex magic uh, on your content to make sure your footer gets pushed to the bottom of the page. Yes, I Please. fail on footer bottom all the time. Like every website I've ever built, I'm always like, make the footer go down. <laughs> I, and I, I fail at it every time. This is why this is footers are the number one reason I don't do front end. <laughs> TLDR min height 100 VH on HTML and body, and then uh, flex on body and flex grow on your content. Yes. And um, the other trick, which I usually lean to, is m just like putting min height on the content of like 500 pixels, mm -hmm. which maybe not even big enough. Um, yeah, good right. to see Tailwind in another one. I think Tailwind just was this Tailwind. Yes, I think we said this was. Yes, that's, no, that's that's not Tailwind. Is it hard card body? 
Is this bootstrap? It doesn't look... I mean, I guess it could look bootstrap. Uh, container meet background hero. Pepsi yes, Paul LGA. This is, this is definitely... This is easy. Yeah, it's bootstrap, right? I think Did bootstrap yeah, like, get utility BG, classes like this. Yes, BG, bootstrap has yeah. utilities now. Yeah, yeah, that's bootstrap. That's I I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> the only framework I've ever worked with in my life was bootstrap, and that but looks there like you bootstrap. Go. This is me. actually I want now we know this is bootstrap. I just want to like really hammer at home. A lot of bootstrap sites look very bootstrap. <laughs> yes, I I, I I've the problem with bootstrap. This does not. This is very well done. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that that nav bar at the top makes me think that it's bootstrap. Like, I don't know. And, and the, the banner across like bootstrap was like famous for like that banner all oh, yeah, the yeah, way across. Banner and then it's hero. Yeah. Yeah. That hero thing. Like that was definitely so not now that I made my screen bigger. I was like, oh, yeah, that looks like a bootstrap site. I didn't know they got utility classes. They've had some utilities for a while. Like even back when I was using bootstrap five years ago, they had some margin stuff then. But I guess they've got more now. Makes sense. Sweet. So it's designed to be like a you know single framework that you just use. Um, yeah. So awesome again. Like having the content is the first part of the battle. So it looks like there's some good content rolling. Really fun to do surveys. But another awesome site. Good to see. I think that's it, right? And that's it. Yeah, that's all of them. Fantastic. And again, if you want a site review, and I think we can start like narrowing down what we'll talk about. Maybe we'll do like segments on like one minute for design, one minute for functionality. Um, but yeah, we can drop a link to our form where you can uh, enter in your site, and we'll do a site review for you. Yeah, I was saying there's also a link there for questions. You know, if you have a question about pretty much anything, ask it, and we might answer. Can't can't say we're going to give you any you know, like legal advice or financial advice or anything, but cloud related question we can probably help out. Definitely. And now for our last and always most fun segment of the day, with our smooth jazz, what's on your mind? This is the segment where we go around the room and just talk about what's on our mind lately as we close out. So as always, we start with Matt because that's just how we do things here. Matt, what's on your mind? Well, next we, we talked about this last week, and next week we should actually do it. We should rename this to the Cloud Chats Therapy Session. Um, we, we said we were going to, and we haven't. Uh, oh, what's on my mind this week? Honestly, very little, um, which in itself is a problem. Um, I've been working like 12-hour days this week, because Oof. work is chaos currently. Um, rebuilding one site stack, and then also starting to work on Hacktoberfest again. Um, it's just been chaos. Uh, oh, it's great chaos, fun chaos. Like, Hacktoberfest is my favorite time of the year, and the chaos is actually the enjoyable part of that. Uh, but yeah, there's very little on my mind because I've just been so in the weeds with that. Uh, like, this like this stream, just on my calendar, I was like, oh my god, I've got, I've got a stream today. <laughs> I can't just be in meetings all day. Um, so yeah, that's it really. Uh, Chris, what's on your mind? Uh, yeah, I have been a little frustrated with chrome as a browser recently it's just taken up so much like everything's getting slow so i went to firefox and firefox also a memory uh huh. hog and then i'm like ah, i didn't want to do it but i'll try it and edge is actually the new edge that's built on chromium is actually very performant uh hmm. and i don't miss much because it is chromium still so are you I using? I don't feel right. You're on Mac OS, right? Yeah, you're on Mac OS, right? <laughs> is it? Is yeah, it's, it's cross platform. Build. Huh. Yep. Really? And, and it has one for the M1 chip. Yeah, Learning new things every really day. It surprises me that Microsoft are publishing an official Mac OS build of Edge. That baffles I mean, my mind. I think I mean, they got I mean, M1 chip sense, right? support before Google did. <laughs> Which, yeah, new Microsoft. New Microsoft. Wow. We've seen new Microsoft for years now, though. It's it's been it, a while. it has been. It honestly, like, ever since uh, Satya Nadella took over as CEO, like, it's just, it's just been, it's just been a wonderful ride. And I know, I know, a lot of older people still have negative feelings towards Microsoft, but mine have pretty much all dissipated. I lived through the Windows Vista era. I, I had a reason to be upset. 
<laughs> Windows 8? No. But did, so, let, let us always remember that, that those years in tech history when we thought that mobile devices were going to destroy the laptop and PC market and everyone was just going to use tablets. Let us look back with great laughter on that <laughs> period of time. Tablets. I mean, if you look at percentages, though, mobile is absolutely dominating. For like, yeah, because everybody has like a phone now. Like, I guess everyone considers the phone mobile, but like, so out of here, I know Chris has a tablet. Who else here has a tablet and actually actively uses their tablet? Nope. I just no? pick up my MacBook and take it where I need to go. It's the same. Uh, like, we, I don't. Are, we're, we're not the right audience, though, the developers, but like, I know a lot of people that don't have laptops and they ever they do everything do. banking and yeah. yeah. I mean, like. My dad, for example, doesn't have a laptop other than his work one, but obviously that's, he uses that strictly for work because it's incredibly locked. He works in healthcare, so it's stupidly locked down. Mm -hmm. um, he has an iPad, and just everything at home he does on the iPad. Okay, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe we're not the target audience here. I think, <laughs> my, I, I think my parents have both, but I don't know. They use the tablet for things you shouldn't use the tablet for. Um, <laughs> Like they like to check the game cams at the ranch, so they go and pull out the micro SD card, put it into an SD card, and then plug it into the. It's like that would have been easier with a laptop than it would have been with a tablet, but whatever you do. <laughs> so I let them do what they're gonna do. Ah, uh, Kim, what's on your mind? Yeah, mine's kind of similar to Matt's. It's August fifth, twenty twenty one. I wouldn't say we're quite, we're not transitioning into fall yet, but um, just as the summer wraps up, I'm thinking like, what things do I want to do in my personal life before it gets cooler? And work life, we have Hacktoberfest coming up, KubeCon is in October, just feels like a big month is is coming up and uh, got like less than two months to prepare for it. So that's what's on my mind. <laughs> I can't believe we're in August already. I know. Where did June and July go? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they uh, they left really quickly. They they went by real fast. <laughs> so this is are the those... calm before the storm. Are June yeah. and July both thirty day months? I'm gonna blame it on that if that's the case. July is thirty one. Thirty one. Okay. July is thirty one. So no excuse. It just decided. I guess. Well, I think we all took vacations during July, yeah. so that definitely explains That's where a true. lot of the time went. So, I think it's also you know it's summer, right? You know. Whether yeah, you it just feels not, you're different. Just, you're slightly detached from work because you're just yeah. having enjoying summer. You no, know, the little bit of it we had. Yeah, definitely. Mason, what's on your mind? Um. I've been having a nostalgic kick lately. My my little brother found this website to like draft old packs of Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And like, we've been doing that and like kind of doing like little quasi tournaments with our friends. And it kind of like just kicked me back into like my childhood and childhood games. So like I'm revisiting like all the old card games and stuff I used to play and looking at like all the old video games I played back like, you know, or whenever I was in middle school and junior high and stuff. And I've just been really like in my spare time, just really enjoying like honestly, I bought a new the new like the latest Yu-Gi-Oh game for Switch, and I was like, "Oh, this is fun! Like I haven't done this in years. Like I remember how this works." Oh, and it's not that good at it, but I'm enjoying it. So it's been a really like just going back in time and enjoying nostalgic things. I don't I don't know why, but that's where I'm at right now, and it's been absolutely fantastic. Like it's been great. So next so, week you're installing Windows Vista. Um, so I never install Windows Vista for fun, but it's eventually I will install a VM of Windows 98 again. So just so I can play the best of Windows Entertainment Package games, because still best collection of video games ever released was on, think, was on Windows 98. Isn't there like a browser emulator for that now where you can like run Windows 98 in JavaScript? That's there is. Like, yeah. <laughs> so it's, same. Not, it's not the same though. Like mm -hmm. having to fight with the drivers so you can get internet. So you can op open up IE4 and try to go to Google is just fun because mm -hmm. <laughs> done with the javascript really was like they don't even use javascript back then i don't think i uh, yeah they don't but google still had their browser their search engine will still work on those old browsers they want a few sites to actively support still yeah definitely well that's what's been on my mind so <sighs> with all with that we're moving on to upcoming events and the end of the show so next week uh, I will be doing a tech talk called dump, uh, Jumping into Django Models. That was kind of hard to say. 
Um, so I will be going over Django, specifically focusing on the Django RRM and talking about models and all of the cool things you can do with the database, but also all of the integrations, like the admin panel and all of that stuff that Django provides with models. Really looking forward to giving that talk. It's going to be super insightful into Django. Um, I've really enjoyed getting into Django lately. Like it's just, I, I, I've always played around with it, but I've never had an excuse to dive deep into it. And now that I'm getting that excuse, I've been really enjoying that. So that's also been on my mind. Um, so next week will be, that's the only event that I see uh, co-hosts. Do we have anything else we want to highlight for next week? Nothing comes to mind. Good. Okay. Then I guess we will move on to the best part of the show. My joke of the day. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay. I like getting Rick rolled and I like Mason's jokes jokes of the day. <laughs> okay. Here we go for the joke of the day. Why do Java programmers have to wear glasses? Why? Because they don't see sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like Kim on that one. <laughs> no, the, yep. The nod. I was waiting. I was waiting for Chris. Chris is reaction. <laughs> yeah. Well, that okay. That one obviously wasn't as great as all the other ones, but <laughs> no, I enjoyed but it. You were still dunking on Java developers, so you know. Yeah. <laughs> Ouch. Leave the Java developers alone. They already they already have it bad enough. They have to program in Java. <laughs> Um, so thank you everyone for attending. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and we'll see you at the same time next week. See you next week.